Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Yeah, so- Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Kurt. I got uh, William Beach Baker in the studio with me, Mike McCullough, Good and, afternoon. and Perry Haichu. How and of do? course, we got Lawrence behind the boards, uh, making us look and sound good. Uh, what, what was the new name of the studios, Lawrence? The Waywalker Studio at uh, Vegas All Net Radio is where we're shooting from here now. They just uh, dubbed that name, so... Way Walker. The Way mm. Walker Studio. That's right. Mm. Coming to you live. That's an odd one. Yep. Yeah. So, what's going on this week, guys? Let's see. Uh, well, yesterday we had the groundbreaking at the Paiute Reservation. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I saw that in the yeah. RJ. Yeah. I'm so telling you. They're, they're building two of them, one here in town. Yeah, um, there's going to be a couple dispensaries, huh? Yeah. One at so. the golf course. Yeah. yeah. Wh- out, of, out, out uh, what, North 95? Yeah, and Lo- yeah, Washington and Las Vegas Boulevard, down by where the smoke shop is for the Indians. Yeah. They're going to have one they there. Had Thirty acres there. I didn't realize their plot of land was so big down there. I just thought it was just kind of the smoke shop and the lot yeah. behind it. I didn't, you know. I didn't either. <laughs> I thought, what are they going to do? Build up or what? You know? Right, but, uh, or just transform the smoke shop? But nope, they yeah, got a whole, but, uh, whole thing going. Well, every, every in other Vegas, anything possible, in town you know, builds up. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's an amazing place. Uh, and then plus out at Snow Mountain. I haven't been out there. I don't know where, how far that is. Me neither. But but there's going to be a, a, they're going to have cultivation. They're going to have everything. Yeah, sounds like a great place yeah, for cultivation. It sounds like oh, I think sto- I think it should be called Wampum. <laughs> Wampum. Wampum. Yeah. Wampum. I think I'll remember <laughs> that. Well, there's a story about it right here. They're, apparently, they're partnering with a uh, company called Ultra Health, an Arizona-based company specializing in healthcare cannabis products. And they think uh, what they have six dispensaries already, mm-hmm. and they're uh, Mm. the blessed recipient of the the tribe's uh, endorsement i mean because the tribe doesn't have to jump through all the hoops that everybody else does because they're a sovereign nation yeah and so by partnering with a group that was already approved even in another state uh they're able to move forward and uh uh you know skip over uh, a lot of other uh, people who wanted to get in the process. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I no. mean, they've got, had a raw deal uh, from the government for a long time. So. Well, it's just the way it is. You know, mm-hmm. it's been that way with casinos and the other industries that they've been able to enter, and some of them have been fairly successful. And I'm, uh, I'm just happy that they're brave enough to go forward with this and kind of take that leap of faith, I suppose, into the industry. I didn't realize there was only 50 or 60 members of that tribe. It's a fairly small local tribe. So between the cultivation, the production facility, and the two dispensaries, they'll create a significant number of jobs available for those who will want them. Mm -hmm. And for the rest, there will be, I I mean, it's going to be a pretty pretty damn good revenue stream for them, i got to imagine. Cultivation, as we know, is labor intensive, yeah, and you could need t- you it, could, it could employ the whole the whole tribe, <laughs> sure. uh, and and far beyond. Some yeah. of the some of the facilities in town are already employ em- right. more people than that. Yeah. And I'm thinking that it's probably a lot more healthier and more economically viable to be in the medical marijuana business than it would be to be in alcohol or gambling. I'm not a Native American, but I'd like to think that it kind of fits into their whole worldview of like holistic healing and you know, doing you know from the earth and you know respecting yeah. nature and things like that. So I, I I would think it's it would be right up their alley on a uh, ideological scale. Yeah, and, and not only that, level, but uh, nature and herbal no. medicine and everything. I think yeah. that's that's perfect. For how, them. Yeah, how politically correct are we on this show these days? Uh, well, we really <laughs> aren't. <laughs> oh, okay. we're, we're balanced, but we're not politically correct. Okay, that, but that, we can that, have fun. That, with then, it. I, then I could say, you know, having them in the alcohol industry is a bit of payback for all the pain they've suffered over the last couple of hundred years. <laughs> yes, they, they, yes, they can give yes. a, a few Europeans some alcohol poisoning. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Uh, cannabis is obviously a much mellower uh, uh, experience, and of course, no one ever in the history of mankind has ever died from cannabis overdose alone. However, cannabis combined with stupidity can often be fatal, but that's anything combined with stupidity. 
can often be a cell fatal. phone combined with stupidity yeah. can yeah. equal yeah. you killing Absolutely. yourself over a selfie. Yeah. Dozens Absolutely of them true. every year, I believe. And you know, it says here that the Department of Justice even issued a memo in late 2014 that paved the way for American Indian tribes to enter the legal weed industry by allowing marijuana to be grown and sold on sovereign land. And one of these, it's not mentioned in the article, but in the extended article I read earlier, one of these chiefs was basically saying that he believes that not today, but maybe down the road, that cannabis will be bigger for the Native American community than game, uh, for the Native American community as a nationwide thing than gaming. Yes, and, uh, I can absolutely believe that. I believe that <coughs> would be for the whole world. Yeah, basically. I mean, yeah. this is this is the Absolutely. next industry. This is you know this is the next you know silicone you know all, this is it. You know right. the tech industry. They all Dot had their coms, booms. The you know, <coughs> cannabis is the next. <coughs> is can the next okay, cannabis so is not going to be a bubble. Cannabis is going to be a sustainable industry mm -hmm. because yeah. the demand has been there for. Yeah. Decades. It's decades, not going right. away. Decades. So will the Indians <laughs> yeah. now be yeah. the Native American tribes be one of the uh, first to experiment with uh, legalized cannabis in, in casinos now? Since well, some of them may want to go into both uh, industries. Last fall, I read about a tribe in South Dakota that uh, had planned on opening the first uh, cannabis-friendly resort. So they would have a cultivation on site. They'd have a, a distribution uh, source on site, and then they'd have uh, you know. A a dude ranch or a resort or that sort of thing and uh, they were just getting ready to break ground on it and they stopped at the last minute because they were essentially told that the federal government would come in mm -hmm. and would stop them and there have been other tribes in South Dakota that have planted uh, hemp crops uh, uh, starting in the Bush administration year after year and have them ripped up by the DEA mm -hmm. you know year after year so you know and, and I you know, I know over the history of this show and, and before, I give a hard time to the federal government and the Obama administration uh, for because I feel they really haven't done enough, especially for a president who was a member of the Chum Gang when he was in uh, uh, when, when he was in high school. But nonetheless, in 2010, we saw the VA making movement forward. In 2014, uh, we saw uh, hemp being able to be grown from the farm bill that got passed. You're mentioning right here this directive from DOJ. So there have been a lot of actually small incremental steps from the government that are not nearly enough to suit right. we activists. Right. But there is movement. At, right. at whatever See, one, one of the major problems in our government is that uh, you have this bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And, okay, these people are not elected. And they run, they actually run the government, and they're not necessarily Democrat or Republican. Sometimes they have their ideology, just like everyone else. And they interpret these things, and sometimes they decide that they're going to keep fighting hemp or marijuana or whatever. And even though the administration may not tell them to do this, it happens. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to kind of deal with the bu bureaucracy, too. Administrations are temporary, yeah. but the bureaucracy is forever. Yeah, it continues. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It sure does. So it, it'll be interesting to see where this uh, group goes and ultimately how they market it. And, and that will, will be an interesting factor because obviously in this new medical cannabis uh, market that it has been regulated here in Nevada, there are very strict limitations on the advertising of these dispensaries and, and of these uh, various services. And will the sovereign nation be exempt from some of that? Will they be able to make, you know, 200 foot neon I, pot leaves uh, in, on, on their uh, dispensary. I don't, I don't know about that. I heard from the chief that in the extended article that they were planning on complying with all the local regulations. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, they don't want to I guess draw too much attention. Right. Well, in their, their business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, yeah, well, we have a little sense. precedent of that because in the casino industry, mm -hmm. they follow a pretty strict rule. And uh, so they, they do fit in with uh, and work with state and federal government on alcohol uh, and all the things that are on the reservation, cigarettes and everything else, other than they don't pay the taxes. Yeah. But other than that, yeah. they do generally follow the rules. So they are yeah. good business people. So, so instead of having 66 dispensaries in the state now, we'll have 68. And right. Ultimately, that's a good thing for well, patients. Well, how many right. sovereign nations are in the state right. of Nevada? Mm. Half good a dozen. And know. what's the answer? I give up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I, I don't know. Let's just say there's half a dozen, and if uh, yeah, each one, if we right. count the feds that own the land, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, still, it's just like you know, there. Depending on how this goes, it might the other tribes might yeah. want to take a. Take yeah, a exactly. you never know. Well, you I, never I think. Know. 
in this business, you, you always have everybody wanting to do it and waiting for the first person to stick their foot – you know, they're towing the pool to see if it's <laughs> yeah, electrified or not. Really? You know? Yeah. And so once the first one does and is up and running and doesn't have an issue, I think you will see a number of others uh, jump on this bandwagon. So, yeah. so. And we will keep you informed. Yeah. So did you hear about uh, Dina Titus coming out this last week? Dina Titus came out? <laughs> yeah. Coming really? Out, coming out in, in, in favor of cannabis again. Came out of the cannabis club. Yeah. No. She, uh, she yeah, actually, she actually put forward a, a bill called, uh, or a policy essay called Puff Puff, Puff Puff Pass, the law that changing les- legislative environment of medical marijuana policy. Are we talking about a, the, the Carers Act? No. She actually uh, put together uh, a new, an article that she wrote. Uh, by Dina Titus that examines the role of our federal government and the U.S. Congress, exposing a history of naked cruelty towards our war-weary vets suffering with PTSD. Where, where was this uh, article published? This article was published in... Let's see, I'll have to find that. She, she put out a tweet about it, and uh, it, they have a blog on it on uh, marijuana.com, uh, which is powered by Weed Maps. And uh, basically, she put together a an essay in an article about you know the fact that we have medical marijuana yet our veterans aren't allowed to use it mm-hmm. so, yes yeah. and this is this has been an evolution from dina and i've been speaking with her on this subject for oh, at least eight years now and um she has come a long way and you know some people will say, oh, my God, that's a flip-flopper. Um, I like to think that we are all able to be informed and be willing and flexible enough to change our opinions as facts are presented to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of the bureaucracy and, and the inherent gridlock that you mentioned, Deej, is, is because people are entrenched in their positions and they keep their minds closed. And yes. they're unwilling to consider other possibilities. Even when new information comes to light, mm-hmm. if there, you know, mm-hmm. new, new science comes to light, people are still just like stuck in there. And I, and I suffer from that. You know, well, we all suffer from that. I think it's a human nature condition. And well. It's hard to kind of break over that, but or break through that sometimes personally. But as a politician, you kind of have a have a duty to, I suppose. You do, and I, I've always found in life the the best way to to get knowledge and to be able to move ahead on various projects is to. Um, Reach out and find the the brightest, most informed minds you can on a subject and absorb everything you possibly can from them. And so fortunately on this area, over the course of years, uh, Dina has had a lot of activists and uh, not only local activists here in Nevada, but as she's a member of Congress now, you have groups like MPP or Normal on the national level reaching out to her. uh, And she is seeing uh, in Colorado, in Washington... Legalization is working, and the sky isn't falling. So I, I you think know, that's a lot of it. We talked about this uh, maybe a couple months ago, or maybe not even that long ago. Um, I think one of us came to the consensus that medical marijuana is the new don't ask, don't tell of the military. Hmm. Yes, it is. And Absolutely. Was that, was and that, that is that the that policy. That? that technically is the policy yeah. of the military. And, it's, it, and that's actually the case of the government on a lot of subjects. Yeah. But it is changing because we see the AMA is changing. We see the vets are oh. changing. We see a lot of uh, administrative uh, from the top down wanting to change, but it's the bureaucracy oh. that runs it, it the middle management. It almost seems like it's an, an individual doctor's decision it's not even the whole va that's doing this it's kind of like is your guy friendly or not or you know what are you willing to how how is he willing to roll because i've heard some stories from veterans who say oh well you know i told my doctor from the va and he gave me the thumbs up and life was good but then i have a buddy who is a former marine right now who's a, a an mma fighter and uh has pt you know was wants to use uh medical mm-hmm. marijuana talked to his doctor about it said he had a card there go his pain meds right there from, uh, right on the spot. And he's just like, you know, because these people are getting such mixed signals, mm-hmm. you know. And so you're told you need to trust your doctor. Got to tell your doctor what's up. You know, this is more than that at the VA and this and that. And then when you do, you get burned because of it. Let, let me ask, Perry, uh, those two examples you gave, are those people both in Las Vegas and go to the same facility? I'm not exactly sure. I could find out. Well, the, the yeah. reason is I, I think directions like that are generally not left to an, an individual foot soldier physician, 
whether a facility is going to, uh, you know, wh whether doctors in a given facility are going to permit it or not, I think comes from a, a so higher level the in the facility. Of the management. Well, yeah, so, some level of management in there is, is I, I think, what's responsible for that. From from everything that I've seen in the government, we we tend not to in the VA give individuals that much autonomy. Okay, right. that's true. And if you are a veteran out there and you have PTSD and you want to use medical marijuana and you're afraid to do it, we want you to contact WeCan702.org. Let us know who you are. Tell us your story, and uh, and we might even have you on the show. Well, yeah. What do you like what do you tell a veteran that come, wants to come on the show? He's scared to lose his VA benefits that are that are left. Right. If well, I speak out and someone hears me, well, you, you, what happens at that point to me and my family? Right. Well, we can keep you anonymous. Yeah, we can, we can keep you off camera you. and, you know, not use any last names. I mean, there you go. like with most of the, all the stories we tell here, you wouldn't know who right. we're talking about. Right. You know, sure. we, don't, we don't use names. So. But, but the truth well, of the matter is when you tell your story, the thousands and thousands of people out there are going to know that you're telling a true story and that it's real because uh, I was in the reserves for 16 years. Mm -hmm. I know I know when a soldier is speaking the truth. Yes. Yeah. We want to do right by people, but we don't want to you know, threaten anyone's livelihood either. So Exactly. So, yeah, and uh, I just pulled up the, the actual article is written in the Harvard Journal on Legislation. Okay. So, okay. And uh, I put a link to it uh, at the top of our Facebook page. So if you check us out on Facebook and you want to read the article, it's, it's right there at the top. Right. So. Outstanding. Uh, it, let me come to a quick story here that just take a, a minute or two. Uh, uh, Paul Armentano, uh, our friend uh, uh, who's the deputy director of uh, National Normal uh, and uh, co-author of the fantastic book, uh, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink?, which refutes just about every <laughs> argument that the prohibitionists have. Anyway, yeah. he, he wrote this uh, uh, short article uh, uh, on a recent poll that says 60 percent of likely California voters support initiative effort to legalize marijuana. And the, so this is going to be moving forward in California. And the, the election this year looks like it's going to be a, a very... <laughs> Uh, dynamic event, and and I've heard the term realignment used, which is something that happens every forty or year forty years or so when significant blocks of political groups reshift and go flip to the other side, mm -hmm. and and we're seeing people on the on the left who say I won't vote for Clinton, so you know I'm going to go for somebody else. People on the right who say I won't vote for Trump, and so uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, but. In, in California here, we have the strongest support, of course, among those 18 to 34-year-olds uh, with 80% in favor and self-identified Democrats at 69% in favor. On the other hand, uh, Republicans at 38% and those Christ. over the age of 65, 46%, were least likely to express support. So this still is very much a, um, a left-right issue. Yeah. yeah, but did you hear what that said? Least likely to express support. That's the boomer generation. I'm a boomer, okay? Boomers boomers are better, by the way. And uh, the Glad truth is uh, that a lot of us don't want to answer those surveys. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I, if you come out this Friday to First Friday to our booth, you will see lots of seniors and they will come by and they will tell us that they support us and that they uh, intend to use medicine and all these things. And uh, you will be amazed. There are millions and millions of us boomers out there that are just ready to converge on all this. Okay, uh, We're just I'm, waiting for the laws to change. I'm all for it. I went to, uh, to a political meeting down in uh, Seven Hills uh, several months ago and when uh, introducing myself and somebody said, oh, what do you do? And I said, well, you know, I'm an advocate for medical cannabis patients. Uh, these 75-year-old grandmas were, were starting, <laughs> oh, I bake cookies and they're really good and I take one in the morning and I use a salve for my, for my yeah. knee. And so, yes, there are a lot of people yep, using this. This sure argument are. is over. The American people have decided. Mm. We just need to get mm. the people who are keeping us uh, under their thumb, mm. you know, legally yeah. right. to change. Seven, yeah. eight years ago, being a cannabis consultant or anything with the word cannabis closed a lot of doors. You know, people didn't want to hear about Still it. They does. don't want to talk. Well, it opens a lot of doors now, though. Like when mm -hmm. if, when I hand people my card, and they flip it over and see the weed leaf or the hemp leaf on the back and and look us up, there's almost always an immediate big ear to ear smile. 
Oh, absolutely. And they're just like, oh, wow. And they just, they want to know more. They're thirsty for knowledge. They want to know all about us. They want to know what we're doing. They want to know, they want to know all that. And it's, it's heartwarming to know that such a disproportionate amount of the people I run into on a daily basis feel so friendly about the issue compared to where we were. Yep. So. so, all right. I think it's time for our first break. Uh, so we're going to take, uh, take the little, listen to our sponsors there and uh, we'll be right back. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702-218-5226 or Kurt, K-U-R-T, at WeCan702.org. WeCan702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at WeCan702, on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. You're listening to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Now, here again, the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Shoot, coming to you live from the Waywalker Studio at Vegas All Net Radio. A couple other sponsors I'd like to stop and thank really quick. Um, make sure you check these guys out because these guys are a big part of what we do and allow us to help educate the public. So if you're looking for medicine, uh, Sahara Wellness over on 420 Sahara. Great girls over there, spa-like in there, wonderful place. Um, also, we have Essence Vegas. Their first location is over on West Trop, Trop and Jones right over there. And then Nevada Pure out on Boulder Highway. So if you're looking for medicine and you're a patient, check these guys out. they got great specials. Make sure you mention We Can, and uh, they'll, get, they'll get you a little bit more out the door. And so. you know what's really cool? It's, it's all homemade homegrown weed and it's homegrown chocolate and it's homegrown everything it's yeah. all nevada homegrown <laughs> there's, 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 yeah. okay nevada homegrown because when i'm looking at at 50, foot commercial yeah. facilities homegrown is not quite what comes to mind right yeah. okay. um, you, know. you know however you know when you're talking about a quality you're talking about a love and a care being put into things it is. and it just is. yesterday um i took a ride down to phoenix and i went into the um the encanto uh medical cannabis dispensary uh uh on west canto uh drive on in phoenix and took a look at um their dispensary took a look at their cultivation techniques and you know there there's that tag that ad line that says happy cows come from california well damn those were some happy plants down there in phoenix and this mm. guy has a wonderful system built up and what i also found really important yeah the quality of the plants was good the presentation in the dispensary was good the, the people were happy were thrilled to be working there but what was even more important in the course of my couple of hours there i must have seen oh, 30 patients go through and they were all happy. They were all smiling. They were, as the, the owner would stop and talk to some of them, you know, these are people who are loyal. And I saw this in the three dispensaries that I had. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I would say to anyone who's in this business out here now, taking care of a little consideration towards patients brings so much loyalty from them. And, you know, there are people who are in this business now who are, are watching sales being slower than, than uh, they expected and costs being higher and regulations being tougher, but you can't translate that through and put that burden on the patients. And if you do take care of them, they will make a great, great 
success of your business. What I saw down there on Phoenix was um, nothing that's rocket science, nothing that is an extraordinary technique that, that anyone who uh, has grown for several years has not tried or experimented, right. but the, the diligence, the cleanliness, the, the overall work environment they had was absolutely top-notch, and I really hope that that's what we get here in Vegas. In some of these dispensaries, we're seeing them um, decked out as lounges. We're seeing them decked out f for what they expect to come in the next year of, of the rec market. And I think that for tourists coming into Vegas, you know, you go to the newest casino, you see this, you see that fancy thing. But if you're really reaching out to a patient's market, I think that all they're concerned about is getting good medicine at a fair price, being tra treated with respect, and, and also feeling that where they're going is, is not going to put them in, in personal legal or, or, or personal danger. Right. And I think that last, that last one we, we've eliminated by having this. But we need to make sure that th as this industry develops that we're keeping that focus on the patients. And even if we have legalization, that medical marijuana basis is not going to go away because down the line... The, there are going to be 15% excise taxes on the on the legal product, but you know tr if it's truly medicine, and this ties in with reducing the schedule uh, in the federal level, those it. people won't be paying taxes. So, p so there will be a, a steady medical marijuana market continuing on even after legalization. Yeah, every state that has done it, uh, Colorado, whatever, they do give quite a break for the patients. Mm -hmm. It's worth having a license. And usually what happens once recreational comes in and medical comes in really strong, more people sign up for medical licenses. Well, you there know, should be a legislative license. session yeah. a few months after the legalization passes, uh, if all goes well. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> y yes and no. I mean, if, if you look at it, if, if we do, uh, you know, right now it looks like a coin flip. And uh, if we have a, a, a big voter turnout, uh, very likely it's going to pass, and we're going to see what happens. Well, but but even if it does, then the legislature picks that up next February. Right. There, it, it will undoubtedly be one of the last bills to get passed before they adjourn in June. Of course. Then gets, gets signed by the governor or just left on his desk and not vetoed. Mm -hmm. And then it won't take place till October. October, and then they're going to send it to Department of Agriculture to come up with the regulations. So it's even if it's legal, it's still going to be a yeah. while. Well, it actually it becomes effect process. in January of 2018 if it passes. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, um, and it will actually help the medical marijuana industry and the patients an awful lot because it will basically end a lot of argument. Mm -hmm. Such as uh, grow, as yeah. being allowed to grow so many plants on our own as patients, right. you know, uh, yeah. because right now we're fighting for that. We're fighting right. for that right to continue to grow our own medicine. But I can tell you from the the legislators, the Nevada state legislators mm -hmm. that I've been speaking to over the past several months, uh, there is a feeling that they do want to. Uh, to stop that sunset provision mm. of patients growing their own plants. Right. It's just what they could get past at the time. But, you know, as as legislators themselves are being educated and changing their minds on this issue, they're more open mm -hmm. to that. Well, well and obviously if we have if we have adult use pass and everyone's allowed everyone is allowed to grow six plants, then us it, as patients, as long can, as there's not a retail right. outlet within yeah. 25 miles, right? Of you, well, see, you know, this and you'd have to grandfather yeah. in. Well, honestly, what, I'm a little concerned yeah. about. What the gets interesting is because you got to always remember, and I bring this up all the time, is that this is a constitutional guarantee. Mm -hmm. So there are constitutional issues. So if the law changes and the voters vote in recreation and they get six plants, I guarantee you, constitutionally, mm -hmm. we have the right to grow at least six plants or more. Mm -hmm. as patients. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the courts are going to be on our side. It might on that be one. right, but it might be end up in the Nevada Supreme Court before yeah. that gets resolved eventually. But, but just yeah. last week, remember, our blessed courts here in, in the district said that they want the legislature to fix this stuff. They right. don't want to be the ones fixing these things. So, you and know. And that's the way it should be. And that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. That, that's know. absolutely well, the way uh, it should be. Uh, in, the, in the future, the courts aren't going to tolerate a lot of the <laughs> stuff the legislature has been passing off right. for 16 years on this issue. Prohibition is over, fellas. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and quite uh, legitimately, the judicial branch of government says, 
you haven't wanted to screw with this hornet's nest for all these years, mm-hmm. and you're passing it to us to fix? Right. No, thank you. That's your job. Well, what they've done is they've actually roadblocked the uh, legislature because uh, if they don't fix this, they're not going to adjudicate on one of these cases. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they could just totally roadblock this whole system. Yes. You know? And, and they, they don't want that. You were mentioning about how we need a big voter turnout Absolutely. in November. I'm very concerned about that. The caucuses gave me bad signals just for this issue. Okay. Republicans who are, as you pointed out, even in California, not so, not so friendly on a political mm-hmm. scale as a, as a voting block. Mm-hmm. Record numbers for the Republicans in the Nevada turnout. Places running out of ballots, lines around the corner. Mm. It was crazy. Well, I, I found the same. I, I did find the same thing at my precinct uh, or my my caucus location at Del Sol High School um, that there were long lines there. But the Democrats hadn't had that bad of a turnout since like '06 mm. in the caucus, and it's just like it, it doesn't mean that they're not going to show up in November. But I just don't like that, considering there was supposed to be you know, so much frustration in this and that that they didn't they didn't show up in the numbers that. They were expected to, I suppose, in the caucus. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, right, right. The, my the own, my own caucus. Last, my precinct uh, in two thousand eight had eighty eight people. This mm-hmm. time, it had sixty nine mm-hmm. people. Oh boy. Well, okay. But the good news is, you know, you're talking about heavy turnout in the Republican caucus. If 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 Senators Rubio or Cruz happen to be the Republican nominee, then I would say we would all worry because they are not going to be friendly to this issue. Uh, a nominee Trump or, or dare I say, President, I, I, I can't say it, but, but if, if, he were, if he were to get into the White House, um, I don't, he is not an ideologue. He's already expressed support for Planned Parenthood. You know, he's well, already he, criticized George W. Bush. Oh, yeah, I heard and him. I think, he's, yeah. I think he would be very laissez-faire uh, on this and letting the market decide. Well, he yeah, actually, you he actually came Christie. out last week and said that he, in plain words, he's in favor of medical marijuana. Yes, he says he doesn't know a lot about recreational, mm-hmm. but he's definitely, absolutely, irrefutably in favor of medical marijuana. I'm all for and that. He, as a businessman, he'd be a fool not to be. Yes. But we got Chris Christie positioning for Attorney <laughs> General now, yeah. and a Chris Christie Attorney General <laughs> would okay. be a disaster Sorry, for us. For laughing. Wow. Yeah. Now, it's him and Giuliani that are kind of jockeying for, in my opinion, Department of Homeland Security and AG. Either one of they're both qualified for both jobs. It's just a matter of who lands on what gig. Because I think that they were kind of two of the first to jump on the Trump train. Yeah. Right. And they are also Northeaster yeah. politicians, except, you know, there's a lot of. There's a lot, a lot for them to get along with, I guess. And that freaks me out in Attorney General Chris Christie yeah. after what he said. He will, he, even if Trump's president, he will do everything he can to shut us down if he's AG. So mm-hmm. a Trump presidency might not be the best for us after all. No, and, no, no, uh, no. Hang on. We know one thing about Trump and, and that he is consistent in one thing. He likes to fire people. And if these people don't <laughs> follow the order and they don't do what he wants them to do and what he feels the uh, masses are leading him to do or whatever, the crowds or whatever, I really think he's going to fire some people. And, and yeah. I'll tell you what, I, I really like the idea. I like the idea. I like to see him fire some Republicans. I like to see him We're fire some see of these guys that are running against him saying stupid oh, When crap. he gets nominated, but he's going to pivot to the center so fast it's going to make your head spin. But, uh, fun, besi- but fire him. But besides that, you know, the Republican caucus last time around had 44,000 total votes and mm-hmm. change. Trump got over 45,000 votes this time. He got more votes this caucus than all of the candidates put together last time. Yeah, there was His over a 100% is increase is unbelievable. Time. But I, I would also point out that, you know, here in Clark County, uh, the Clark County Republican Party has been in disarray for some years and, and had no money the and, and no too. organization. And, yeah. and in 2012, the whole Ron Paul uh, well, what happened, brouhaha split the party Yeah, I can as tell well. you a little more detail I'm still on that. better about that. That's why. It basically what happened over the years is the Republican Party is the Clark County Republican Party took over the state party, basically. And it's more of a libertarian style Republican Party mm-hmm. that's that's in the 
in in the leadership positions to run the state party. But they're at loggerheads with the rhinos that mm -hmm. have the money and the Adelsons and the so on and so forth. So it's really a grassroots battle. What's happening across the country, the Republican Party is being taken over by the grassroots libertarian style <laughs> Republicans, and eventually the conservatives are being marginalized. Well, and, and Bernie, the, uh, that's part of that Bernie's and that's what's happening across the country. It's been happening for 10 years. It's going to continue to happen. I was so pissed off. I called the rhinos in Washington, D.C. and told them that I'm fed up. Well, Bernie Sanders said yeah. there's a political revolution happening in this country, and he's absolutely right. right. It's just not happening on the and side of the aisle like that Bernie people too. expected it to happen Well, it's on. a populist <laughs> revolution yeah. that, that is spilling out onto both sides, actually. Absolutely. With both Sanders and Trump right. uh, being seen as uh, straight talkers, right. at the very least. And that would be a wonderful campaign, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, oh my God. capitalism that would, that would against be socialism a, and, and two people that are be a libertarian dream something. to run as a third party. Uh, that, yeah, that, that those would be two, but still, it's it's okay, you know. So you know, getting you know, getting back out of politics, wonkiness, right. and and into <laughs> cannabis uh, right. a, a little bit here, past that joint. Um, I, I've got a story that I, I read last night when I got home from uh, rawstory.com, and uh, it's legal marijuana industry poised for major U.S. expansion by the end of 2016, uh, written by. Asian Sea Falls Press, uh, and it says that legal marijuana is uh, becoming more entrenched in the United States in each year. Well, we all know that, uh, but they're saying that this year could be a tipping point because by the end of the year, nearly a dozen states will decide whether to legalize pot, and seven of them are determining whether they're going to allow recreational use. Wow. I mean, that is a big jump in in you know in one electoral cycle. Now. Interestingly, beginning at the beginning of this year, 86% of Americans live in a state permitting cannabis use in some form. Right. You know, and it's amazing <clears throat> that it's still federally illegal and still most of the states don't allow it, yet 86% of the people are living in medical cannabis Okay, but see, tw what you don't understand is 23 states have it totally legalized for patients, mm -hmm. and then you have 18 states that have it decriminalized for mm -hmm. whatever purpose. But within all 50, almost all 50 states, probably 48 of them, uh, there is some jurisdiction within that state that is decriminalized or legalized or allowed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even though the state or the county might be against it, some little town might say okie dokie. I would say that's probably less true down in the Bible Belt in the Deep South. That, I don't know. know. I, Although I we're really seeing don't know about that. There, You're seeing cracks there, know, too. That Louisiana, the state legislature, mm -hmm. uh, is starting to consider this. And they're not looking there, that they're going to pass it this year. Many state legislatures on this issue, it takes several sessions right. for an idea to solidify and build enough support. But well, that they're talking about it even in that deep of the South is, is a good sign. Well, the truth is uh, there's two big movements going on. There's a battle between between big old Texas and Florida. Mm -hmm. And Florida's going to be the first one, okay, to get into this, into medical marijuana, into legalization and recreation and all Very that. Likely. And that's going to snowball the eastern half of the south. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at Tex at Tennessee and all that. But once Texas goes, once they drop, the rest of the country goes. Because New York, Texas, California, and Florida, they really do have a tremendous influence on those regions that, they, that they're in. But you're talking about New York, which is, of course, my home state, mm -hmm. and, how, and they do have a medical marijuana program. However, it's exceptionally restrictive. It yeah, does it not even allow smoking of the plant. Right. It has to be done in a, yeah. in a concentrate form. Which is one of the most ridiculous things you've ever seen, <laughs> But c considering New York. But the mm -hmm. truth is, there's a massive movement in New York and all around that region to change that. And it's going to change very rapidly. But also, you know, you talk about decriminalization, and even though the New York Medical Marijuana Program, although it in in actual existence, is is something of a, of a mess and a nightmare for patients to have to deal with, um, you guys know that my sister was a, a NYPD for for 26 years. She says that the law in in New York is you can you can have garbage bags full of pot. You can have hay bales of pot, and it's still a misdemeanor. <laughs> So, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and you compare that with uh, over two and a half ounces in this state is, is a hard felony. Yeah. Well, actually, the, the law in this state is you can only purchase two and a half ounces every two weeks. Right. As for 
in your home right. as a patient, there are no limits set. Yeah, there is nothing in legislation that says you can have this much in your house. Well, I mean, there are the, the hard limits of, of twelve plants, and I and it, although there still is that doctor's recommendation, you know, in medical necessity, uh, the the authorities have said they're taking a much harder line on this. But since that medical marijuana case that got uh, 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 decided last year where the, the jury acquitted the patient, mm. uh, we haven't really seen mm. the DA's office pushing on this issue. I, I think they realize how difficult it is to actually impanel 12 jurors in this day and age in this state who are going to convict medical marijuana no. users. Well, remember all the fun we used to have going to court, Mike? Uh, <laughs> yes. And, our, uh, and well, we, from your perspective, it may have been fun. From <laughs> maybe mine, not from yours. it was a little different. But, you know, sometimes you had fun. <laughs> but uh, let's face it, uh, we would show up at the courthouse, and our patients would show up, and uh, our supporters would show up, and, the, and we would be all dressed up and decked out mm -hmm. and supporting the patients. And you know what? I think that really made a big difference. So it it's, does. It's very important to get involved and in, uh, in to be involved in We Can. We're a patient advocacy group. We none of us get paid to do this, folks. That's correct. Uh, so you know, come on out. First Friday is coming up this week. We have a booth for that. We've got, yeah, we got uh, all kinds of fun stuff coming up. We got, yeah, First Friday is on this Friday. Uh, over, we're at the Arts Factory. Right. Behind the, the Arts Factory right western there. Western side of the building. Charleston and Maine, is it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're right, we're, we're right there. You can't and miss us. Also, um, this Sunday... Over at the uh, soccer fields, over uh, over at the um, the stadium, Sam Boyd Soccer Complex. Yeah, yeah, the Sam Boyd Soccer Complex. Uh, the travel joint is having a cannabis kickball tournament. Yeah, I it's think a patients only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's at the Sam Boyd Soccer Fields uh, starting at noon on Sunday, and they're hosting a uh, <laughs> they're hosting a cannabis kickball uh, game during the Rugby Seven World Finals. That sounds fun. During yeah. the World Finals. Yep. Well, yeah. we have come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> so it says, uh, it says um, cannabis kickball combines the relaxed sport of kickball with social networking of the Las Vegas cannabis industry to create a fun-filled day to meet new people, enjoy food, drink, and play kickball in a comfortable, non-intimidating social atmosphere. So, mm. Fantastic. Yeah. So. Well, you know, obviously... Uh, medical cannabis and uh, and responsible adult use are sweeping the country and and it it is inexorably marching forward I think uh, there are um, uh, groups that uh, uh, an analysis groups that say that by the year 2020 this is going to be a 22 billion dollar market in America and I think that's conservatively used. speaking yeah mm -hmm. and, and that's why they're saying this is going to this year is going to be a tipping point you know, for Colorado and Washington uh, when recreational hit in 2012 uh, their sales have increased 30 percent per year on average that's phenomenal business growth that any other industry would give its <laughs> eye teeth for right. US pot sales climbed to 4.6 billion dollars in 2014 and are expected to reach uh, 21.8 billion uh, by 2020 this this uh, new frontier uh, industry analysis group says yeah. and so you know this this explosion in sales is, is primarily due to legalization in these states and and they're looking at California and all uh, and while medical pot uh, in 2014 was re represented 92 percent of the market, by uh, 2018 it's expected to fall to 47 percent. So the legalization market is just going to be huge all mm. over the place. And what it does is not only makes the money for the people who are in that business itself, you know, the industrial growing operations, the retailers that, the edibles, the factories, but there's a demand for the equipment, the high-end $150,000 cannabis oil extraction machines, oh, yeah. the lights, the, the real estate, everything. The construction work the, the, you need. You bet. It, it, it really is going to fund. When I was in, in Denver had it, had, with a dispensary in 2009, you had a, a city that had a commercial real estate market that was slanting downward with, with 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 two percent negative revenue uh, uh, year to year, and when the medical marijuana industry came there and all those dispensaries opened up, they took in going from a small loss to a big gain in the commercial real estate mm -hmm. market. So there will be waves and ripples of this legalization uh, effort throughout the the sectors of the economy. 
Yeah, so absolutely. what else do they say um, here? Uh, um, also, that... Uh, you know they're paying huge taxes, and this is really what's fueling the growth in legislatures, ar- uh, mm-hmm. you know, around the country. Uh, Colorado earned 135 million dollars in taxes and licensing fees on nearly a billion dollars of pot sales. State of Washington took in 70 million of pot uh, of tax revenue on 257 million of um, of actual sales. So we've got big numbers, and that's that's mm-hmm. what's pushing some of these other states that are having financial crisis to move in this direction and look for that revenue more than anything else. So there, there's really some exciting stuff. Now, one, one thing that I noticed in this article, which is really fascinating, and I had never really thought about it, but, but anybody who grows really should, uh, especially indoor, that cannabis is the greediest of crops in terms of electricity, accounting for 1% of all electricity used in the United States for an annual annual cost of six billion dollars a year I think to grow pot a gross in underestimate because there's a lot of people stealing power mm-hmm. and oh, yeah. a lot like mm-hmm. i think it's more around two or three percent like people uh, there was a lady we had on a long time ago Lori something who was talking about this a long mm-hmm. time ago about how how thirsty the cannabis industry is for power and mm-hmm. really how local municipalities that want to open these big pot farms have no idea about what kind of drain it can be on their local grid Yes. Before they get into it, you yes. know what I mean? They just go exactly. ahead and approve it, and they're like, yeah. oh, my God, we don't know if we're going to be able to, to do this during the summer. You know? I, I've been in one place that's, that's pulling uh, 8,500 amps, and uh, they're in, they've got new machinery to install to grab another 5,000 amps. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a tremendous amount. Well, I mean, but here we are in the Southwest, and we could greenhouse this stuff easily. When I was at Encanto in Phoenix yesterday, I saw they're doing all their vegging in a in a greenhouse and what they're doing is taking their taking their hot air out of their uh, out of their other cultivation rooms flowing it out through there keeps it nice and cool you've got the bright sunlight and beautiful beautiful plants so you know as we get more legalization i think that pers- that that electricity usage can go down absolutely but it's it's dependent on these legislators understanding that you don't have to lock this plant up in a in an airtight building and keep it, you know, hidden away from any speck of light or or, or anything natural. Right. Yeah, and with solar and everything, and here in Nevada, you know, we're battling over the with the solar mm-hmm. with uh, Warren Buffett's uh, battle well, with you, us over solar. I think you could grow a lot of a lot of grass yeah. out in like Overton or Mesquite or even Armagosa Valley. Sure, Valley. because they're already growing agricultural products sure, out there. Yeah, I think there's even a couple of vineyards out in Armagosa if you look for them. Yeah, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like you can grow out there if you have the the ability. I was looking at a pine tree farm out there a long time ago. The guy wanted to turn it into an industrial hemp farm because hmm. there's a, you know there's tons of groundwater in the wells. Hmm. There's a lot of people who have this infrastructure built up ready to roll. But you know, people aren't buying pine trees for, for projects like they used to anymore. So, you know what I mean? You got to do something with it. And mm-hmm. uh, it is kind of unfortunate that we've been so restricted by that. But that's something to clear up later on. It can, it can always be undone. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but I think as we move forward, uh, this will allow us to to grow these plants under natural light at least at least in the vegetative mm-hmm. stage because currently electricity costs up to 50% of the wholesale price of right. cannabis i mean that's oh my God. that's yeah. a big chunk right. in most businesses labor is your biggest source right. of overhead but 50%. here well you know yeah. because well, somebody's got to pay yeah. for all that 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 electricity you're stealing perry right okay. well we talk about the billion dollar industry in cannabis but there is the billion Jesus. dollar industry in energy savings mm-hmm. and uh and and we really are going for that it's just like having solar or wind power or anything else and i think the american people have finally got onto this that uh, this can be done whether it's in an automobile or in a building or whatever. And um, as the industry becomes more legal, then more people will create more inventions and more ideas and more ways of uh, being able to grow these products and make it as cheap as possible well, because we've got to drive the price down. LED you lighting? see the innovation in this market by taking what was, you know, 100 years ago or 50 years ago was sativa, indica, and ruderalis. And now what do we have? 3,000 uh, strains, 4,000 strains. Oh strains it's Who incredible knows? and throughout the, the 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 last 45 years of, of the drug war 
people who were cultivating had to come up, had to be innovative, had to be resourceful, and they've come up with all sorts of new inventions and strains right. and everything, and that's going to drive this industry forward. Well, yeah, now Lego is just amazing. Like, I mean, just to go to a champ show to see every from year to year how much new stuff there is mm -hmm. and how much better it is or how much uh, more fun it is. And yeah. so what you guys can do out there who, who are listening to this audience is we're in election season now and we're in an election year that's important. Get out there and talk to these people. Find find who your, your assembly person is. How, find who your state senator are, your congress person, and, and get out there to some of these campaign events, you know, not just to rah-rah, but just to say, hey – I, I don't want to be a criminal. I don't want to feel like I'm a criminal. I don't want to have to go for special licensing and this and that and everything. I, and give them your opinion. Whatever your beliefs are, that's the time that they will be most receptive to your message. And you don't necessarily, you don't even have to give them any money, give them a campaign con right. contribution. You just give them your two cents. Right. But don't forget to also join WeCan702.org and, and send your donations in and join us and become a member and come to our St. Patrick's Day party or our big gigantic incredible 420 party coming up yeah that's right uh after uh, the next coming events up we have well we have our patients medical support group on march 12th at two o'clock at our new location which is right next to the source dispensary on the Yay! corner of uh sahara and rainbow so what is yeah. it the southeast corner yeah the southeast yeah. corner so that uh, we're moving from the coffee bean and tea leaf to to the the new the new place right next to the source. So. Oh, boo! Yeah. <laughs> We're like the Jefferson boo. moving to the boo. west side. <laughs> well, they're they're well, gonna. I, I only live five minutes from the coffee bean <laughs> and tea leaf. It's a half an hour. <laughs> yeah. the well, I live five yeah. minutes from the source. They uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they they won't let us reserve the rooms anymore. So we've run into a few problems where we just didn't have a space to yeah, hold yeah, our yeah. meetings. So so we've we moved moved over to the yeah, source. So we're at, just thankful at that, that we, we still want to thank the coffee bean and tea. We've been there for excellent half a dozen years at least. And it's not just us they're not letting use No, we know the that. The room is now nobody can book right. it. But so. we just want to say we yeah. are grateful. Thank yeah, you. Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We yep. appreciate the, the support that we get in the community. We've met mm -hmm. at various businesses mm -hmm. around the valley over these years uh, and dealt with various business people. We've had donations uh, to, that give us office furniture and things. And, and we are so tremendously appreciative of the support that we get there mm -hmm. through the community. And where Kurt and Beach are saying you should join we can. Yes, because it is that strength of numbers. It is you giving us the permission to essentially speak for you when we're talking to these people in the halls of powers that, that puts the wind at our backs and that gives us the uh, the legitimacy to go in there and, and demand changes on the behalf of patients. And I do say demand changes because we ask for these things and, and we've asked for years and years and years and nothing happened. But it wasn't until we can start again going up there and legis and lobbying in the halls of the state legislature that we actually got stuff done. Right. And your contributions are tax deductible. Yep. Okay. 100%. That's right. 100%. And then next we have our St. Fatty's Day weekend patient potluck. So Did you say St. Patty's Day? St. Fatty's Day. St. Patty's Day. Right before St. Beach's Day. We're doing a we're doing a potluck for patients and caregivers only. Um, it's all on our w website weekend702.org and that's on uh, Saturday, March 19th. Mm -hmm. And that runs from 1 to 6 and we're doing it at the Garden House. So it is on private private residence there. So and it is patients and caregivers only. So mm -hmm. and then uh, our big 420 weekend emerald garden gala that we have going on april 16th out in boulder city so any of you that were at our our uh Halloween party. It's a fantastic location. Yeah. And, and yeah, if you want to well. dress up in a theme costume or, or whatever, I mean, we do like to give away a lot of prizes, especially if you come up with a good marijuana mm -hmm. costume. Yep. And, and uh, I was uh, I just talked to our friends over at Pulse Glass, and they're sending us out some glass for a raffle out there. So oh, man, come on lovely. out. You know, the, the tickets for this are $25 at the door. You can get them for $20 in advance. If you go to our website, there's a link. You can pre-purchase them. Save yourself 20% there. And the raffle tickets are only a dollar a piece. Right. And and some of these glass bongs and stuff are like seven, eight hundred dollars a piece. They can be quite expensive, and they're works of art. We are very blessed with the generosity that people have. And, and I think it's because the people who are in this industry see the work that uh, that 
this group of people have been doing for these years, and they understand that these monies raised are going out to support patients. To we we have the uh, the indigent patient program where mm-hmm. where we help people who can't afford to get on the program, and there are so many good things that are doing with with this money, and a hundred percent of this money goes to helping patients and moving this industry, moving this this patient movement forward. Nobody here takes a salary. No, and. Uh, well, well, some of the money does go to our upkeep of our website and our, our you know, newly that, beautiful revamped website. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, because we have to pay for the hosting and we have the, well, our, but that's all, our that's CRMs all and yeah, expenses. all of our all of our normal business expenses. But as as for that, we spend our money like it's the patient's money because it is. So, so. Well, we thank you for listening, and what else you got, Kurt? That pretty much wraps it up. Quick shout-out to our sponsors again over at Sahara Wellness, uh, Essence Vegas, and Nevada Pure. Thank you for your support, and remember, if you're going to go buy something, support them first. And, uh, you know, and thank you for the Waywalker Studio and Vegas All Net Radio for having us on the air. And And we'll we'll see you next time. On the radio. Views and opinions expressed on this program were those of the hosts and guests and did not necessarily reflect those of Vegas All Net Radio, its affiliates, or its parent company.